Good morning, church. Hey, thanks. Today we finish up Matthew chapter 9. So let's stand together and read it. Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 through 38. Again, Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 through 38. This is the word of the Lord. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He cast out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Please be seated. Lord, we come before you and we ask now that you would give us insight into your word. Show us how to apply it properly to our lives. Pray that we would have understanding and insight and that the, the spirit would speak to us, that we would be molded and shaped by your word. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> in chapters 8 and 9 of Matthew, we've seen a highly concentrated accounting of Jesus' miracles. But especially, you'll notice, his healing miracles over and over again. All the way back in chapter 4, verse 23, we read that Jesus went about healing every disease and every affliction. Then in chapter 8, verse 9, in chapters 8 and 9, rather, Jesus helped a leper, a centurion's servant from a distance, two demon-possessed men, a paralytic, a woman with a bleeding disease, and a girl whom he rose from the dead, all of which were healings. And today, we read that he healed two more men who were blind and another demon-possessed man. And then we have a restatement Almost word for word of Matthew 4.23 in chapter 9, verse 35, where Jesus heals every disease and every affliction. Now, there's many reasons why Matthew is telling his story like this. As we'll see, this statement in verses 35 through 38, they set up the second discourse in the Gospel of Matthew, which is in chapter 10. Matthew also includes all of these healings together because he wants us to understand that Jesus has authority over all things. The Sermon on the Mount ended with that declaration of his teaching. Chapters 8 and 9 are a demonstration of that authority. And that was especially true in chapter 8. But we learned last week that Jesus has authority over ritual cleanness and over death itself. And a third reason Matthew includes all of these healings so close together is because it actually happened like that. Jesus' ministry, as we'll see once again, focused on teaching, preaching, and healing. He gathered huge crowds around him, and when he does that, he heals them. We saw that in chapter 8, verse 16. But today's text tells us the personal reason Jesus healed so many people. Verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. This is the heart of Christ for the people that he sees. Jesus' compassion has been on display in these last two chapters. He heals the leper with a touch. He goes across the lake to the scary, demon-oppressed men who are Gentiles and changes their lives. He calls a tax collector as a disciple. He speaks gently to the paralyzed man who's afflicted first and foremost by his sin. 
He turns and encourages a woman who has suffered for 12 years with an incurable disease and calls her daughter. Jesus' compassion flows out of him. It is his character. And it's obvious that his heart is heavy for these broken people. Jesus' compassion is what unites each three of these episodes in Matthew 9 in our text today. So first, Jesus' compassion inspires faith. Matthew tells us that Jesus encounters two blind men as he's passing on his way from there. So in our mind's eye, Matthew wants us to see Jesus leaving the synagogue ruler's house where he just raised a young girl from the dead. And now he's heading toward home. And on the road, these two blind men are made aware of Jesus' passing by and they cry out after him. How are they made aware? They're blind. We're not sure. How do they follow him? They're blind. We're not sure. But they probably hear him. Jesus always had big crowds around him. And he's famous at this point. So they yell out to him. They cry, have mercy on us, son of David. This is the first time in the gospel where Jesus is addressed with that title. If you are a person who marks in their Bible, circle that. Son of David. You'll remember that in the beginning of the book, Matthew wanted us to be aware that Jesus was to be the promised king in the line of David. The genealogy, the famous genealogy everyone skips over at the very beginning of Matthew, has David as its hinge. He's the middle of the genealogy. The angel then addresses Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, as son of David. Then Matthew quotes Micah, chapter 5, uh, in, in chapter 2 of the book of Matthew, the famous verse that we read a few weeks ago, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. That's a Davidic promise with Davidic imagery. But since chapter 2, Matthew has left this theme to the side. He established that Jesus is the rightful Davidic king all the way back then. And then it's been his program to show us that Jesus has kingly authority in his teaching and in his works. And now his kingly title is finally being recognized by two Israelite men. And this won't be the only time he's called son of David. When it comes up, notice it and circle it. We'll see it a few times in the middle of the book, a little little bit more sparsely, but it will come up quite frequently in chapters 20, 21, and 22. So for them to call Jesus the son of David is kind of coming out of the blue. It's a great expression of faith. They're essentially calling him the Messiah, which is exactly what that title meant. Their plea for him to have mercy on them, you'll remember, is exactly what Jesus wants to do. Jesus' words in verse 13 of chapter 9 were these. Go and learn what this means, he says to the Pharisees. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So Jesus is about to practice what he preaches. The blind men connect the idea of the son of David with the idea of mercy and healing. It's a, it's a great expression of faith. Again, many wanted the Messiah to be king. They expected that. But many didn't expect that the king would focus his earthly ministry on mercy, culminating in his death on the cross. And today, I think our world, and many of us in the past, maybe even some today, have those expectations exactly flipped. We expect a God who shows mercy time and time again, who heals us and has to heal us and has to give us everything we might want. But we don't want to be ruled. We don't want a king. These two blind men, unable to see their surroundings, rightly perceive that Jesus is both king and bringer of mercy, that these are not exclusive. He rules and he heals. They follow Jesus then to a house. Whose house? Well, we don't know that for sure. In chapter 8, verse 20, Jesus says that he has no place to lay his head. So some have taken that to mean that Jesus was just homeless the whole time. But chapter 4, verse 13, tells us that Jesus lived in Capernaum. That was his home. 
And chapter 8, verse 14, right after, tells us that he received hospitality from Peter. So it's perfectly possible that Jesus had his own house. But most likely, Jesus lived in Peter's household during his time in Capernaum. That's probably where Jesus brings these two blind men, somewhere private. I find it interesting that Matthew mentions that they go inside. Jesus doesn't want this healing to be done in public. He doesn't invite the crowds in. And he'll make it explicit in a moment. Verse 28 says, When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it done to you. Jesus centers their healing around their expression of faith. He centers their healing around their expression of faith. He asks, do you believe that I'm able to do this? He doesn't ask, do you believe you can be healed? He doesn't ask, do you believe that God can heal you? He says, do you believe that I am able to do this? Jesus is looking for a faith response to him. He is the one with the authority given by God to heal. Do these men believe that? It's easy enough to say, have mercy on us, son of David. It's another thing to explicitly affirm while he's standing in front of you asking you if he is in fact capable of healing your blindness. Their response, once again, reveals their faith. Yes, Lord. And by calling Jesus Lord, they recognize his authority and his ability. Their faith is big. Jesus' response to their confession of faith reminds me of last week's sermon. The woman who was healed was told by Jesus that her faith had made her well. And Jesus says here, according to your faith, be it done to you. Now, I don't want to rehash what we went over last week, but you'll remember that Jesus doesn't mean that it is their mere faith that has healed them just because they had faith in general. That's not why they're healed. Faith without the right object is the wrong kind of faith. But they had clearly placed their faith in Jesus. That's what the whole episode focuses on. Do you believe that I can do this? They say yes. They've called him Son of David and Lord, they trust that he's the only one that can help them see. And Jesus honors their faith by touching their eyes and restoring their sight. And that touch is no small detail either. For a blind person to be touched by the healer is a great extension of compassion. How would a blind man know if they were about to be healed by Jesus? Jesus doesn't have to do anything when he heals. He doesn't have to touch them. We already know that Jesus doesn't even have to be in the same geographical location as somebody to heal them. But he touches their eyes to express his compassion and love and comfort to them. And Jesus heals these two blind men with a touch. And they're immediately healed. Jesus had compassion on these two men. How did they know that he was the son of David? How did they know that he was the Lord? I mean, undoubtedly, they heard stories of Jesus going around. You remember, Jesus is the most famous person in Capernaum at the time. And surely they're just waiting for the right moment to ask for mercy. Notice they're on the side of the road. In chapter 20, Matthew will have a very similar story, almost a a mirror telling of this story. I, I believe they're two different episodes, but this is really interesting. Two guys get healed twice in the book of Matthew, and both times they cry out, have mercy on us, son of David. People know who Jesus is. And with that knowledge, they act. Because Jesus' compassion expressed to other people inspires their faith. Jesus says, according to their faith, they're made well. Before their physical sight is restored, Jesus tells them that their spiritual sight is functioning the right way. They have it right in their hearts. Their faith is in the right person. Jesus heals their physical sight to bring it in line with their faith, their spiritual sight that they already possess. Jesus' most common healings in the scriptures 
are of blind people. He does it eight times throughout the Gospels. And interesting enough, throughout all of the scriptures, the only person to ever heal the blind is Jesus. In Acts chapter 9, the story of Paul on the road to Damascus, Paul is blinded by Jesus, you remember. Scales cover his eyes. And he sends Ananias, Jesus sends Ananias, a servant of his, to do the work of Christ to remove those scales from his eyes. It's Jesus who blinds and who restores sight. And that is always the case with our God. Our God restores our sight. The message is clear in the story. Jesus restores sight to the blind, both physically in his earthly ministry and spiritually now. The physical healings of blindness point forward to our regeneration in the spirit where we regain our spiritual sight. We were all once blind to our sin, happy with it even, content with it. But our eyes have been opened by the mercy of Christ. Praise the Lord. Verse 30 tells us their eyes were opened. They were immediately able to see. And the first thing that they see is Jesus. But Matthew tells us that Jesus moves right into a warning. We don't get any further warmth. We aren't told that they jump up and down in praise or anything like that. It actually moves to a stern statement. Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about it. Why doesn't Jesus want them to spread the news of their healing? You'd think that the Messiah would want that. Well, as we've been seeing through this chapter time and again, Opposition to Jesus is ramping up, and he doesn't want it to accelerate too fast. Jesus also doesn't want people following him for the wrong reasons. In John chapter 6, Jesus feeds 5,000 people. That's one of the only miracles recorded in all four Gospels. It's one of his most famous miracles. Right after he feeds the 5,000 men and however many women and children, He hops and walks onto the sea. You remember the disciples are crossing across the sea. Well, right after that, right after Jesus walks on water, we're told that the crowd realized Jesus had crossed to the other side. And so what do they do? They walk all the way around to meet him. Jesus understood what they really wanted when he finally meets the crowd on the other side of the lake. They want another free meal. So he tells them, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Stop looking for more bread for your mouths. Feed on me the bread of life. Jesus had compassion on the crowds. He wanted to heal their brokenness. He wanted the people, though, to understand that their brokenness wasn't primarily their physical needs, their physical diseases and defects their primary need that needed to be addressed by Jesus' compassion and mercy was their sinful hearts. He was the bread of life. So he tells these two blind men not to say anything. Matthew tells us he sternly tells them. But do the men listen? Verse 31 says, But they went away and spread his fame throughout all that district. In one way, we can understand this, right? I mean, these guys were blind, and now they're healed. They can see. If they danced their way out of the home, we we could probably understand that, right? People would notice that two formerly blind men were now fully healed. But they take it a step further than just being normal people in society. They, They spread it through all that district. They become evangelists to their surrounding area. And we don't want to be upset with these guys, right? We want to understand them. We don't want to see that they did anything wrong, especially since we try to encourage each other and ourselves to share our faith this boldly. We want to be like these two guys who are excited about Jesus. But Jesus sternly warned them not to. It wasn't tongue in cheek, guys, don't tell anybody. No, Jesus was serious, and they don't listen. Sometimes, our immense faith doesn't result in right obedience. They're not always parallel to each other. And sometimes we get them confused. 
If I believe hard enough, if I am so on fire for the Lord like this, I must not be sinning. But our obedience needs to be in line with our faith. We need to make sure that our immense faith results in proper obedience to Jesus' word. These men had one, but not the other. Jesus' compassion had changed these guys' lives. So again, we can understand. and we can, we can maybe forgive them with Jesus. But in our lives, we should seek to bring our faith in line with our obedience. And their faithful response to Jesus was a result of his compassion for them. That's because, second, Jesus' compassion sparks a response. After the blind men leave to spread their story, Matthew tells us that as they were going away, a demon-possessed or oppressed man was brought to Jesus. Matthew mentions that the particular way this demon is oppressing this man is by taking away his ability to speak and maybe even his ability to hear And Matthew doesn't spend much time on the healing. He doesn't even record Jesus saying anything. But verse 33 says, And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. Again, we're not told what the man says or what happens with him after Jesus heals him. The the healing and the man aren't really the point of this small episode, although there are a couple little things to notice about it. Once again, Jesus has complete control over demons, complete authority over them. It's nothing for Jesus to cast out a demon. He has complete control. And once the demon is cast out, the man is immediately able to speak. There's no further healing needed. Sometimes the scriptures include physical ailments like this when someone is demon-possessed or oppressed, but not every time. And we should be careful not to make the mistake of thinking that whenever someone is healed or uh, whenever someone is healed, a demon is cast out, or whenever someone is sick, it's because they're demon-oppressed. That's not true either. Some demons cause sickness and disabilities, but not all sickness and disabilities are caused by demons. So we need to use discernment here, don't we? But again, the demons and the healings aren't the main focus of the story. So we can't get into the differences between being demon-oppressed and demon-possessed and how Jesus cast this demon out and so on and so forth. The main focus is on the two responses to the healing in verses 33 and 34. The crowd who witnessed the exorcism, the crowd is marveled. They say, never was anything like this seen in Israel. Now, because of the way Matthew presents this healing, we might think that this response is a bit strong, right? Didn't these guys know Jesus raised a little girl from the dead, like just a little bit ago? Didn't they know he calmed a storm? Why are they so wowed by what seems to be a simple exorcism? Not even the first one we're told about in the Gospel of Matthew. First of all, I think we'd all be pretty amazed at any of these immediate healings in the presence of Christ. But I think that Matthew is placing this here because he wants us to understand that the crowd is responding to all of the miracles recorded in chapters 8 and 9. He's putting their, their amazement here for us as a bookend because now we're going to move into another discourse in chapter 10. At the very end of chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount, the crowd was astonished at the authority Jesus had in his teaching. And in verse 8 of chapter 9, the crowd is full of the fear of the Lord at Jesus' authority to forgive sins. And now they marvel at his healings. So their emotional response is correct. They should marvel at Jesus Christ, the God-man. And their statement is true. There had been no one like Jesus before or since. And when we see Jesus act, our responses should be similar. We should marvel at the many ways God works in our lives, and we should praise him for his uniqueness. There is still no one like Jesus. And we should marvel at his power and authority. But the crowd's response isn't the only response Matthew writes down. Verse 34. But the Pharisees said, 
He casts out demons by the prince of demons. There's been growing opposition to Christ throughout this chapter. But now it breaks forth. It's been boiling up and now it boils over into blasphemy. Jesus doesn't respond to that accusation, which he'll do in chapter 12. They'll make the same accusation there. The Pharisees had a chance to get on board. And by all accounts, some did. Last week I said that the synagogue ruler was probably a Pharisee himself. But by and large, the Pharisees openly opposed Jesus. And it's at this point that that starts. Open opposition. They will only make life harder for him. And their response represents the other potential reaction someone might have to Jesus and to Jesus' work. The Pharisees set their will against him. They openly oppose Jesus. They consciously choose to believe that he does these things as an instrument of Satan, even though they have no proof. All of Jesus' miracles point in the opposite direction. Nevertheless, they choose to believe otherwise. And that's, that's still pretty common today. With many people, open opposition to Jesus is a comfortable place for many people to be. The Pharisees would have had to give up their normal lives. They would have had to give up a lot to fully recognize that Jesus is the son of David, the Lord, the Messiah. For them to do that would be to reject their whole system and to become his disciples, even though they had disciples. They had a lot to lose. So instead, they take the easy route and they dismiss him as a demonic actor and go about their business. It's very sad. And we should be sad. But it's pretty normal, unfortunately. I wonder who comes to mind for you of those who are in opposition to Jesus, who openly embrace the darkness rather than his rule. Your heart should feel compassion for them, as Jesus' does. Jesus doesn't get upset at the Pharisees here. He doesn't even respond. Jesus is full of compassion for the lost. And even those that we see in opposition to him, we should be moved toward. Jesus' compassion toward these broken people sparks a response, positive or negative. Either a response of faith and truth or an accusation of evil. And when you witness the power of Jesus, what will your response be? Third, Jesus' compassion calls for a harvest. At this point in the narrative, Matthew pulls back to give us a bird's eye view of the next few months of Jesus' life. He tells us that he went throughout all the cities and villages, presumably in the region of Galilee. Matthew tells us specifically later when he goes to Judah. If Jesus hit two towns a day in Galilee, it would take him four months. If he went to every town and went to their synagogue, four months. So it probably took a lot longer. The point isn't, though, on how much time Jesus spent in his travels. The point is what he did. Matthew says, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. That right there is a summary of Jesus' ministry. If you were asked, what did Jesus do before he died on the cross and rose from the grave? You You should say this. He taught, he proclaimed or preached, and he healed people. And we've seen him do each of these things in the gospel so far. He's taught on the law extensively in the Sermon on the Mount. Wherever he goes, he preaches the good news of the kingdom of heaven, and he heals everyone in need. And two of these things he's about to empower his disciples to do. That's why we're giving this statement again. They went with him to all of these places. They saw how he did it. So, When they're asked to do the same thing in chapter 10, they've received training. They know what Jesus is talking about. Verse 36 brings us back from the bird's eye view to Jesus reflecting on the people that are following him and coming to him for healing and for help. 
He looks out on the crowds wherever he goes and has compassion for them. Matthew says, Jesus has compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus sees these people and is moved with compassion. The word Matthew uses here that's translated as compassion is a Greek idiom that's something more like he was moved in his inward parts. Our phrase gut feeling is kind of close, gets to the point of the Greek here, even though it means something different for us. I think a better understanding of it would be something like this. Jesus had a visceral reaction of compassion for the crowds. He is overwhelmed emotionally for them. He wants to help them because they look like beaten down and broken sheep. And why do they appear broken down? Because they're like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus laments their lack of godly leadership. These people have been burdened under the law and have suffered much at at the hands of so-called leaders for far too long. And these leaders are motivated by outward signs of spirituality and by their own wealth and by their own status. They aren't motivated by compassion. They're not motivated by love for their people. But Jesus is the good shepherd. In Numbers 27, Moses prays. This is... Verses 16 and 17, he prays, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord, listen, may not be as a sheep that has no shepherd. Matthew seems to have this exact scripture in mind. When Jesus looks out on the congregation, he sees sheep without a shepherd. But now... Their shepherd has come to them and he is inwardly moved by love toward them. He desires to see them thrive. But all he sees right now are helpless and harassed sheep. And the metaphor changes in verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. The harvest are all those who might enter the kingdom of heaven. Later on, Jesus will make a distinction between the wheat and the chaff. But that's not present here. When Jesus looks out onto this crowd of broken people, sheep without a shepherd, all throughout Galilee, he sees a beautiful harvest ready to be brought in. When we look out onto the world, and we see how broken and messed up it is, do we see a harvest like Jesus did? Or do we look at all of the problems that the world has and hope that it doesn't get too close to us? Do we hope that those problems would stay far away, that the broken sheep would just kind of stay in their pen in that direction? That's not how God views the world. He sees a harvest of people ready to be brought into the kingdom. Lord, give us that attitude today. You are the Lord of the harvest. There are so many lost people that the Lord has prepared to enter his kingdom. And he is the Lord of the harvest. But where are the laborers? That's Jesus' point. Who's doing the work of harvesting? At this point in the story, it's really only Jesus. So it's an understatement to say that the laborers are few. There's one laborer. John the Baptist is even in prison. There's no one else doing the work. So what does Jesus tell his disciples to do? He doesn't send them out right away. He doesn't say, you need to step up. He tells them to pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. God is the Lord of the harvest. He knows who will be brought into the kingdom. He sees it, and he has chosen to bring that harvest in using Christians like you. 
There's a great shortage of workers for the harvest still. Now, I'm not just referring to pastors and to missionaries, although there is a big shortage, a real big shortage in that department. I'm talking about everyday people who participate. Are we willing to do the work of harvesting where we're called? Do we look out onto the world and see lost sheep in need of a shepherd? Are we moved by compassion toward them? Are we moved like Christ to bring them the good news? Jesus tells the disciples to pray for laborers for the harvest. And as we'll find out in the next chapter, their prayers will be answered. They will be the laborers for the harvest. It's not an uncommon story. When we start praying for gospel workers, we tend to become one. But this is the natural extension of Jesus' compassion. He doesn't just want to heal people physically. When he looks out onto the crowds finally here in chapter 9, he isn't moved to go to each one and heal them. He is moved to call for laborers for the harvest. He doesn't want to just heal people physically. He wants to restore people spiritually. And going to the cross, he accomplished the means of forgiveness. And now all people can be saved by his grace through faith. Amen? But laborers are needed. You, Christian, are needed. So we're going to end with a little bit longer time of prayer doing exactly what Jesus commands his disciples to do. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and do exactly that individually. Who is placed on your heart now? What is the Lord bringing to you so that you can be a laborer for his harvest? Spend time praying to the Lord earnestly for laborers to bring in the harvest. Let's pray. Lord, we earnestly ask you to raise up laborers for your harvest. We pray that you would give us eyes to look out onto the world and see a harvest white, a, a, a crop white for harvest, Lord, to be brought in, ready to be brought in. Not opposition, not enemies, not annoyances, but people who need you and who are hungry to hear your word. Lord, we ask for people to do that work. We pray that you would move in specific people's hearts to do specific ministries. Even today, Lord, for those gathered here this morning, I pray that you would impress upon them what you have called them to do here in their hometown, in their community. Lord, we know that you have specific work for us. Lord, let, let there not be a time, a season, a year when you don't bring somebody to us to hear the gospel. We pray that you would entrust us with that work. We pray that we would have the integrity to do it. Lord, we love you. We pray that our hearts would be as compassionate for the lost and for the world as Christ's was. In Jesus' name, amen.